I'm a virologist, so I will talk about how using microscopy to study um, infectious diseases, so how a virus replicates inside the cells. Um, and basically, we will use uh, as a, an example my favorite viruses that are uh, positive strain RNA viruses. So the topic of today's talk will be uh, a brief introduction to virology. So, so we are all on the same page discussing uh, how RNA viruses work. Then we will focus on one of the topic that you, it's my favorite uh, research topic that have the viral replication organelles. And these are the structure that you have seen already with the Roma, uh, where viruses replicate their genome inside the cells. And finally, I will show you how virus infection in general can remodel the cellular landscape to create an environment that helps and support uh, viral replication. And I will give you two examples uh, from studies we did on uh, flaviviruses and uh, more recently on coronaviruses. So starting from the first thing, what, let's start really from the back. So what's a virus? Huh? Let's start with the definition of what a virus can be. So this is a kind of definition I took from uh, Vincent Bracaniello. A virus is a small, obligate intracellular parasite that compresses some genetic material, DNA or RNA, often surrounded by protein, shell, sometimes a membrane. So you can already hear a uh, lot of qualities about what a virus is. First of all, it's an obligate intracellular parasite, so it needs a cell to function, needs a cell to reproduce and create more viruses. And also, we have a, a hint on the sides of the virus. Viruses are smaller. So why we say this? Because you can see this is the scale in cell biology is often used to demonstrate how things can move from a very small uh, objects like uh, lipids, single protein, micromolecular complexes that are in the order of the nanometers to big things like frog cells that are in the order of millimeters. And to visualize these things in biology, you need the different uh, techniques. And viruses sit here on the average is 100 nanometers. And basically this is the uh, limit, just below the limit of the resolution of light. So these entities are too small to be clearly visualized with the light microscope because the resolution of light, the diffraction limit of light is around 200 nanometers. So you can visualize them using super resolution microscopy. So uh, su um, bypassing this diffraction limit. Or, of course, you can visualize viruses. And this is exploded. The viruses have been visualized by electron microscope. And through electron microscopy, we now know the structure of many viruses. For instance, this is a, the structure of SARS-CoV-2 that was developed uh, in August 2020, just five months after we isolated the viruses. So now cry microscopy, electron microscopy and cry electron microscopy allows to identify and characterize the structure of a virus in a very quick manner. You just need, just need to isolate the virus and analyze its structure under the microscope. And you can get uh, information of the proteins that populate your virus. In this case, we can see the spikes of uh, SARS-CoV-2 de uh, decorating the envelope of the virus. And thanks to the cryo-electron microscopy, you can also have structural features of these macromolecular complexes of this protein. For instance, you can visualize that some of the protein here look like this, and this is a perfusion conformation of the spike. It's actually what's needed by the virus to enter the cells. But some protein look like this, like a post that is the post-fusion conformation of the spike. That is how the spike switch after it's fu it, while fusing with the cells. So not only you have the overall structure, the overall feature, the structural feature of the, vi the virus, but you also have information on how these molecules, the viral molecules, decorate uh, the, the surface <coughs> of the virus. So basically, electron microscopy is the technique the, of election to visualize uh, viruses. And this is uh, the conformation of the, of the spike product. However, we said that viruses are small. Indeed, this is not uh, really true because more and more viruses that are very large, around 400 nanometers for mimi viruses, and even 1.5 micrometer for phytoviruses, it's basically almost a small bacteria. And he, he, these kind of things can even be visualized by light microscope. You can see in, in phase contrast this structure. So we have to think that in most of the cases, viruses are small, but this definition doesn't apply to all the viruses that exist. Moreover, what instead all of them requires is that they need the cells to replicate. So they are still, all viruses are intracellular parasites. And basically, uh, we can think about viruses being an organism that has two stages. So uh, this is the 
philosophical question if a virus is alive or not. If we consider the virion, the entity of the virus, what we observe with the electron microscopy, this is clearly not alive because it cannot reproduce, it cannot replicate without the cells. But we, we have at this stage when the virus interacts with the host, when it enters into the cells and creates a new entity that is not to the cells from before, that is not to the virus alone, these things for sure is alive, it's a cell, but these things is not anymore a uh, normal cell, it's a factory that produces novel viruses. So it's a different entity and this entity for sure is alive. So we can consider viruses as two-stage organism. And as I showed you before, these entities is very small and can only observe 90% of the time, if not 99%, 99% of the time, we can only analyze it by electron microscope. But here, when the virus interacts with the host, we can study this interaction using both electron microscopy and light microscopy. And here we can study all the processes that the virus can induce on those the cells, how the virus can uh, uh, adjust host function, like protein, metabolites, membrane, and uh, Roman already showed you how the virus can do amazing things inside the cells. We can study all these processes by microscopy, by imaging, and visualize how the virus can change and infect the cells. So this is, in general, a very simplified uh, life cycle of the virus. So the virus enters the cell usually by attaching over a receptor. It enters, it's delivered, its genetic material is delivered inside the cell. This genetic material can be delivered to the cytosol or in the nucleus, go to an amplification state, it's amplified. Novel genetic material is, is made. From this genetic material, viral proteins are produced, so novel viruses are assembled and then secreted to interact with the uh, spread of the infection within the host. For our, our purpose today, we will discuss only about RNA viruses. And this po is particular positive strand RNA viruses. And you have to keep in mind that these viruses, the genomic material, this genetic material of this virus never reach the nucleus. So this virus replicates the, the material inside the cytosol of the cells. And why this is important? It's important because the cytosol is an hostile environment for the virus. In the cytosol, there are present all the sensors of the innate immunity that are there and want to sense, can sense if something strange is happening, like if there is a genetic material for a foreign object, like a virus. And if they sense for a material, they will activate an immune response that can block and stop a viral infection. So viruses are, are smart and they hide this genetic material inside the cell. So the, so the cells cannot understand that something is happening until it's too late. And now they do this. They modify the cells. They create a novel environment that, is, that supports viral replication. I don't want to go to viral classification, I just want to show that you can have viruses with several kinds of genomes, but for our purpose today, we only discuss about positive strand RNA viruses. And why you should be concerned about this virus is that if we look at the last hundred years, these are some of the most important uh, pandemics, if we want, that we had in the last hundred years. And you can see, you know, Spanish flu back in the early century, 19th century. Then we have uh, HIV, uh, dengue viruses, swine flu, Ebola, and now SARS-CoV-2. What they have all in common is that they have a genome that is either positive or negative RNA. So, and they are all often from a zo zoonotic origin. They come from uh, the wildlife. So if something will kill us in the future, it's probably a uh, positive and uh, of an virus. So we have to think about studying them to be prepared. And 2019 SARS-CoV-2 uh, teach us a lot. So let's go back. RNA virus need to uh, protect their genome. And they do so by remodeling the cellular and the membrane system. They reshape the cell to create an environment where this RNA, where the genome can be protected. And we call this viral replication organelles. This is a, a novel entity, it's a, it's a specialized endomembrane structure, it's a specialized environment induced by the virus where the genome replication takes place. And as you can see here, thanks to electron microscopy, we now know the ultra structure, the three-dimensional structure of this replication organelle for many kinds of positive standard RNA viruses. And we also found out that each virus has its own niche a favorite place inside the cells well, to install this replication organelle. For instance, Flocus virus use the mitochondrial membrane to create a replication organ. Uh, Tombo virus uh, uses the um, peroxisome to create a replication organelle. And many uh, human pathogens, such as hepatitis C virus, flaviviruses, dengue, Zika, West Nile, 
coronaviruses <coughs> use the endoplasmic reticulum to create a replication organelle. So each own virus has its own favorite organelle where to install the replication organelle. And as I said before, the main function of this organelle are, first of all, as the name suggests, viral replication organelle. They are the site for viral genome replication. In addition, they are used, it's an enclosed space. It's a separate space. And inside the cell, this is used to coordinate all the steps of the viral replication cycle. They help to coordinate the genome replication, genome translation, and genome assembly by, taking, by compartmentalizing these different steps. You have to consider that the viral genome is the, it's a molecule of RNA. Okay? And this is basically usually ready to use. This, it enters the cells, it gets translated because it's very similar to the cellular mRNA. So the viral genome, the same uh, molecule is at the template for three different processes. It's replicated by the polymerase of the virus, it's translated by the ribosome, and exactly the same molecule is encapsulated inside the division. So all these three processes work on the same molecule. And they cannot work together. If it's the, uh, the polymerase is engaging the RNA molecule, this cannot be translated. And if it's translated, cannot be encapsulated. So all these processes to function properly need to be compartmentalized. And viral replication organelles help to compartmentalize, to keep a replication in one place, translation will occur in another place, assembly in another place. And finally, as I said before, this is a way for the virus to shield between a compartment, between the membrane, to shield the genome from the action, for the recognition by the innate immune sensors. So all the positive strand RNA viruses made this, make this beautiful structure. But when we look how they are organized, the topology of the viral replication organelle, how they look inside the cells, we have only two main morphotypes. We call this structure, these two morphotypes. So they can eat, virus can either induce invagination in the donor membrane of the organelle, or they can create a protrusion from this donor membrane that eventually bend and form double membrane vesicles, as you have seen with SARS. So no matter if you have a virus that infects a mosquito, if you infect plants, uh, no matter if you make a replication organelle inside the chloroplast or inside the mitochondria, when you look at the structure, they have either invagination or double membrane vesicle protrusions. And this is very important because if this structure are very conserved among different viruses, it means that there may be a host factor that is used by viruses with similar replication organelles and is shared by these viruses. And if we find this host factor, we might have a target to create antivirals that can work against all the viruses that share a similar topology of replication organ. My basic main tasks, so let's say my main interest, is to characterize the structure of this replication organelle, but also the molecular composition, which are the proteins that accumulate here, both viral protein and host factors. And now we do this. We are here in a in microscopy course. So uh, of course, one of the main techniques that one can use is microscopy, seeing is believing. So our idea is to visualize which are the molecules that decorate these uh, organelles, but also to visualize using electron microscopy the overall ultrastructure. So when we consider these kind of entities, the cell infected cells and the viral replication organelle, we, create, we use an integrated approach that combines light microscopy using super resolution, like cell imaging, high content screening, as you've seen in the past days, and combining the, the data, the molecular data that we get from here, because here you can have information about the dynamics or protein or the which are the molecules that are there, combining this information with electron microscopy that gives you resolution structure. And by combining these two data sets, performing correlative light and electron microscopy, as you have seen by Roman today, we can have a, an idea not only of the molecular composition, but also the structural composition of this organ. So let's go, uh, I will make a, a brief in explanation of a different two kinds uh, of both morphotypes. So we will discuss about uh, uh, model virus that induce uh, invaginated vesicles and model virus that can induce uh, double membrane vesicles. Let's start with the invaginated vesicles. One of my favorite viruses that is able to induce this membrane remodeling in the AV, invagination in the AV, are flaviviruses. Flaviviruses, this is the classical genome of a flavivirus. It has two modules, okay? Uh, it's a single, uh, one molecule of RNA that translates a single polyprotein. This is a single polyprotein that gets cleaved by both host factor and viral proteases. And these are all the viral proteins. It's basically just a few proteins, 10 proteins. And it has two main modules, as I said before. This 
part of the structural protein and they are used to make the virus. And this part of the non-structural proteins and they are used to make viral replication. So only this module is used to replicate the viral genome. And you can use o express only this protein altogether and, and replicate the viral genome in absence of any structural protein. So our interest was to understand how an infected the replication organelle of uh, flaviviruses, for instance, in Zika virus of um, other flaviviruses. And when you infect the cells with the flavi, this is how it looks like in EM. You have a normal ER, some overproliferated uh, endoplasmic reticulum. You can have a bit of Golgi, some mitochondria. And at one point, you start spotting strange things here. So what's happening here? These are how viral replication organelles for flavivirus look like. You can see some swollen ER membrane. There are uh, also ribosomes here. And inside, you can see this array of vesicles that have the viral replication organelle, invagination in the ER. And you can also spot some viruses. Uh, flaviviruses are really small, around 40 nanometers, so they look like small dots. And these viruses are going to be secreted inside the Golgi. So electron microscopy allows us to get the structure of the replication organelle, but to clearly understand how the three-dimensional sh shape of this uh, organelle uh, look like, we need to perform uh, um, electron tomography. That is basically a way to get information on three-dimensional three information of uh, uh, using electron microscopy. Basically, you cut a very thick section, thanks, and then you uh, tilt this uh, specimen and back record the image in electron microscopy to the image projection of this object in different, uh, uh, in different conformation. And then you back project all this image to reconstruct a 3D image of your object of interest. When we did this on infected cells by Zika virus, this is what happened. So this is the uh, how electron tomography of a, um, a Zika virus infected cells look like. And these are basically the replication organelle of Zika virus inside the cells. Zika is one of these flaviviruses. And as you can see, now we can clearly see that these vesicles that look like bolts inside the AV have invagination of the AV that forms uh, this uh, 80 nanometer vesicle that are connected to this neck, this pore, with the cytosol. And indeed, this neck allows to exchange metabolites, but also the viral genome uh, that is replicated inside the vesicles with outside. Often, in front of these pores, or in front of this neck, we see uh, assemblies event. And you can see clearly here, this is a vesicle, this is an open, the open the neck, and then you get regions that assemble in front. So basically, this, as I said before, this is a way to compartmentalize two different processes. This virus has developed this strategy that replicates its genome inside these vesicles, and the genome, as soon as it's replicated, doesn't travel to the cytosol to reach assembly. And this might be viscous, uh, risky because it can activate innate response, but it's directly encapsulated in the ER cisterna in front of, the, of this, we call this vesicle packet, and create a virus that bud and gate inside the ER. So using this uh, uh, strategy, the virus is able to compartmentalize uh, genome replication and uh, genome assembly. Now, uh, we can have a beautiful three-dimensional structure, but just electron microscopy doesn't tell anything about which are the factors that are here. What we get is a beautiful gray image that doesn't tell us anything about which are the protein, the, mole the molecules that populate this structure. And we are in particular interested in which were the host factor that are present on the replication organelle. <laughs> so uh, first of all, we wanted to visualize how the virus can uh, change the, the cell. And to do this, we use a reported system, basically a protein fused to a GFP that is linked to the membrane of the AV. And when we analyze infected cells that have this report, uh, when we are uh, doing infection by a flavivirus, dengue or Zika virus, you can see that they accumulate this, this large granule inside the cells. So basically, our interest now is uh, what these granules are and how the AV is involved, how ER protein are involved in the model induced by uh, flavivirus inside the cells. If you look at the, uh, the AV shaping factors, so protein of the AV is able to change the shape of the AV, we have a different protein that might be involved in, uh, that might be co-opted by the virus to create a replication organelle. And indeed, uh, there are some several proteins that are able to shape the ER membrane, like reticulums, that create this curvature in the ER sheet, 
Climp 62 that create, gives the space of the, the ER sheet, and atlastins that are used to fuse two ER tubules. And indeed, we analyzed all these proteins, the involvement in a flavivirus replication, and we found out that when you knock, knock out or knock down atlastin, you have a strong reduction in dengue and Zika replication. So this host factor might be used by the virus to create, together with the viral protein, to create this uh, replication organelle. But how we can prove this? Of course, the first thing that you may think is to perform uh, imaging. So take an infected cells and analyze where the atlastin, our target ER protein, localized. We did this, and this is an infected cell standard for atlastin-3. And you can see that uh, indeed there are clusters where atlastin-3 is present in these infected cells. But we do not have enough resolution to understand if these clusters are or not replication organelle. To get more resolution, one can perform super, uh, super resolution microscopy, and, and we did the STED microscope here, to gain uh, more information about these clusters. However, even with reaching a 20 nanometer resolution, this is the best you can get. So more precise pan time inside the cells. But we still lack the context, we still lack the structural features to really say, OK, my atlastin T protein is required to make replication organelle. So how we solve this, how we can solve this issue? By performing convelative light and electron microscopy, we can search for this spot where atlastin is and check which is the structure that is underneath this atlastin. And I mean, uh, I will not uh, describe this part that is basically what uh, Roman just did. So uh, we can use light microscopy to follow uh, molecules uh, using light inside the cells, and we can combine it with the electron microscopy to get cellular context. Electron microscopy gives you the, all the cell, all the information about the context of uh, the cell with the very high resolution, but it lacks molecular context. Everything is, is gray. You cannot have a, you don't know which molecule is here, but you can combine these two techniques and find one cell in light microscopy, the same cell in electron microscopy, and correlate these two data sets. And now you have uh, the cellular context and also the molecular, con molecular contrast. You can know which are the molecules that populate these structures. And as Roman told you before, correlative li light and electron microscopy is not one technique. It's an approach. You are combinating two te different techniques. And you can basically create correlative light and electron microscopy approach as weird as you want. You can cook them in a very different way. And the one that we used for our lasting project was this one, we, similar to what uh, Roman showed to you. We grow cells on a dish that has a grid. We image them by light microscopy. At last, was a GFP. We fix them, embed the cell in a block. Uh, this is a block of uh, fixed cells. We cut those cells, and then we search for the same region where the cells of interest were present. For instance, you can see here, these are uh, cell infected showing atlastid signal in, uh, in green. And you can see this is my cell of interest. It's uh, on 8M position. Let's go back and search for this 8M position. So first you image these cells. You get molecular contrast. You, you know where your uh, protein of interest is. Then you embed these cells. You create a block. You break this block. And you cut exactly in the position 8M, so where your cell of interest was. And then you, you finally acquire your image your electron microscopy image, and then you registrate this image on this image. How you registrate this image? Registration is basically you have two different, completely different data set, and this is one of the most important step of uh, uh, correlative light and electron microscopy. These data sets were produced on cells, sometimes alive, it was produced on cells on a plastic dish. This image was produced on cells inside a block cut by a knife, an image in the vacuum. So although they depict the same object, their dimensions are completely different, also their orientation and shape. So you need to find a way to take this image and bring on top of this. And we use some fiducials, something that can be visualized in light microscopy and can be clearly visualized in electron microscopy and allow you to register, to, to correlate these two data sets. In this case, we use the lipid droplet. Lipid droplet can be stained by a dye. They are round, they are nice, they look like balls. And they are really electron, electron dense when you perform a staining by electron microscopy. So you can basically use a lipid droplet. You can clearly see these have a one, two, three, four lipid droplets, and they are here. One, two, this one, two, 
three here, four, five. So using a simple registration procedure, you can finally automatically rotate this on this and correlate the two data sets. So let's go back to, uh, to the R. We applied this technique on our at last in three spots inside the cells. And we found out that indeed these regions, when we look in the M, it's exactly the same cells. And when we correlate these two data sets, in the region where we see the accumulation of atlastin inside the cells, we found replication organelle of the virus. So indeed, atlastin might be co-opted by the virus. Atlastin is an ER membrane shaping. Uh, it's able to change the shape of the ER tubules. So uh, it can be co-opted by the virus to create, to support the formation of the replication organelle. So thanks to the, uh, this is to summarize this part, basically thanks to imaging and combining like microscopy and electron microscopy, we can now not create a, a model where we have the structure of the replication organelle, but also we know the molecules using light microscopy that can decorate this uh, replication organelle. And now we can have a, analyzing which are these molecules that are present here, we can have a novel target that we can use to create antivirals. Because if this atlastin is used by many viruses that induce the formation of imaginative vesicle, we may think of creating a compound that block this function of atlastin by, by doing this reduced viral replication inside the cell. So this was about the first morphotype, the imaginative spheres. Now I want to, to uh, show you uh, the second part that is about double membrane vesicles, so the second morphotype, the protrusion morphotype. And for this, we will use another, uh, uh, let's say, model organism that have a uh, model virus that have the coronaviruses. So this is the genome of the coronavirus. You can see it's very longer. It's a very long genome with respect to the one of the flavi. Flavi virus is 10,000. It's as big as this one. This is three times the size, and it contains many more functions. But again, the modules are always the same. You have structural proteins, that are involved in the formation of the virus, and you have no structural proteins that are involved in the replication of the genome. If uh, SARS co um, coronavirus also codes for accessory factors that are involved in pathogenesis, okay, in uh, stopping uh, the response of the cell. And this is the uh, how the replication cycle of SARS-CoV-2 uh, appears. So the virus binds ACE2 on the membrane. It can be either internalized by endocytosis, or if there is present also another protest in PS2, it's directly fused on the plasma membrane. It releases the genome. The genome is ready to use. It's a molecule that looks like an mRNA. It's translated. Viral proteins decorate the R and induce this formation of these double membrane vesicles. And within double membrane vesicles, the genome replicates. More viral proteins are produced. Structural proteins are produced, decorate the Golgi and Elgic membranes. We even assemble here and goes up. So again, our aim was to perform exactly the same approach. We wanted to infect the cells and look how the virus is able to alter the endomembrane structure of the cells, how the virus is able to induce, reorganize the, the cellular landscape, cellular organelle, to create this viral replication organelle. And again, we combine light microscopy and electron microscopy. So first of all, uh, we decided in this case to Take a look not only at the replication organelle, be really focused what happened in this region, but we wanted to analyze the, the cell it's in its entirety. We wanted to see all the changes that SARS-CoV-2 was able to induce on infected cells. And for doing this, we used focused ion beam scanning electron microscopy. That is this technique that Roman already showed to you, where you can achieve uh, to image very large region by embedding these cells again in your plastic uh, section. With the focused ion beam, you cut a region of these cells, and then you image by ACM, and you get a part of the cell. And then you again, with the focus ion beam, you remove eight nanometer of this material, and then you image the cell again. And then keep going and keep going until you, you image all your cell. This is a destructive uh, approach. You are destroying your specimen, but by destroying it, you are acquiring uh, uh, an ACM image of your specimen, scanning electron microscope image. And this is basically when we apply this technique to any cells infected by SARS-CoV-2. This is a lung epithelial cells, uh, Calu-3 cell. And this is, uh, you can see that it's infected. All these white dots here are viral replication organelle. And in this rendering, you can see that these DMBs in uh, red have spread all over the cell. They are not localized in one region, but they decorate the entirety of the cells. You can see the Golgi in blue here that is scattered 
destroyed in this Golgi mini stack and scattered all over the region, all, the, all over the cells. And of course, uh, the endoplasmic reticulum, where the double membrane vesicle originate, is completely remodeled. In fact, if we, we zoom in this uh, perinuclear region where clusters of DMB are localized, you can see what Roman was showing you before, that all the DMBs do not float inside the cytosol, but are connected to the cellular ER through this modified ER membrane that we have this zippered ER with very limited luminar space that act as a glue that connect on one side of the double membrane vesicles and on the other side the ER. And this is a, uh, a still image of the, what I showed you before. You can see double membrane vesicles. You can see Golgi mini stack scattered all over the cell, usually in close con contact with the DMBs. And you, when you zoom here at higher resolution, you can see that all these DMBs are like chevy on a branches of the on ER branches that are connected together by this modified ER membrane that is formed basically by zippered ER membrane. Of course, FibSem is beautiful, gives you very nice image, but it's not high throughput. You can acquire one or two cells because it takes days to do something like this. So uh, and, uh, uh, we got this observation that there were destruction inside the cells, but to gain more information, we perform uh, electron tomography, acquiring uh, around 245 tomograms of an infected cells at different time post-infection. And thanks to this high throughput, we were able to uh, understand how the virus remodel at high resolution all the cellular organelles. And this is one of the uh, electron tomography that we reconstructed. This is the reconstruction of this image. You can see again double membrane vesicles here in red that are really close in space to the Golgi and the Elgic, here in blue and cyan. And in the Golgi and the Elgic, you can see assembly event. So these are regions that are assembling inside the Golgi membrane. You can see how they bend the Golgi cisterna to start the assembly process. And this is again special proximity between the replication organelle, the DMVs, and the assembly site, the Golgi Energic. Again, also for coronavirus, are two, the same principle that we did, we, we got for flavivirus. This virus brings together the two sites, the assembly site and the replication site, in order to have the best and the most, uh, the optimal uh, production of viruses. And we also find some other things. For instance, in infected cells, we see a lot of peroxisome that were in contact with DMBs. This, this sausage, electron dense sausages are peroxisome. And maybe this can be a function for, that can be used by the virus to detoxify uh, the, from ROS species, reactive oxygen species that can be formed during the replication or um, RNA uh, replication. So, all these tomograms, all these FIPSEM data allow us to give a, more or less have an idea of how this double membrane vesicle are originating inside the cells. For instance, at every time point, this was the topology we most often observe. You can see double membrane vesicles here that come out from normal ER. This is a normal ER, the size is around 40 nanometers. It's still full of ribosome. And they look like chevy on the branches. This is uh, basically, this is what happened at the early time point. But if you move at later time point, this ER started to collapse and form this connector membrane. And you can see the luminous space is completely reduced from 40 nanometers to 14 nanometers. It's almost absent. So these two membranes are zippered together. And now these connector membranes connect the double membrane vesicles that in this moment appear bigger and larger respect to these. This connector connects the double membrane vesicle to unmodified ER in this region. So, more or less, this is what we think it can happen. At the every time point, the double membrane vesicle originates from normal ER, and by starting getting uh, protein lipids from the ER, they start to grow and uh, collapse the ER region that connects the DMVs with the ER. And through this collapsing, they start to select which kind of uh, nutrient or lipids or, or factor from the host cells they want to bring to the DMVs. Eventually, this region uh, can uh, be, be uh, detached from the connection, and DMVs can also be found as sing single entities in the inside the cells. However, this is most often what we see. All the DMVs connected to the connector member. So now uh, we obtain some information about what happened uh, in infected cells. However, we wanted to reach higher resolution and to really prove that inside the cell, that inside the double membrane vesicles, 
that was the replication of the RNA of the virus. Here, we assume that the RNA is replicated, but we don't know because we cannot visualize mm -hmm. RNA. Here, everything is extracted. So there is no structural features. H how you know that the RNA is present here? It makes sense. Everyone says so, but we cannot see it. To see, uh, to try to find the structural feature, we combine the FibSem with the cryoEM. And this technique is called cryofib cell. It, it basically uh, froze the cell, you, you freeze the cell uh, at cryogenic temperature directly on a grid, and then you image these cells. Of course, these cells are too thick to be much like this, because electron can pass only if the material is around 200 nanometer thick. So what you have to do? You have to cut these cells and open a window inside the cells. We call this window a lamella. And you can cut it using this focus ion beam. So now you have your frozen cells, you put in the focus ion beam, you cut the material from up here and down here, and then you get this super thin lamella that look like a window inside your cells. And now you can look inside here using electron tomography and perform structural analysis of these cells. And this is what look like when you do cryofibsem on SARS-CoV-2 infected cells, and you can see that you have a much more details here of the structural of the macromolecular complexes that decorate this region. You can see individual spike protein that decorate this vesicle where the virus is budding. You can see nucleocapsid here that accumulate RNA. And you can start to see this is double membrane vesicles. And this is our target. What happened inside the double membrane vesicles? So when we went inside the double membrane vesicles, this is what happened. Now you can finally see this filament inside the vesicle. And this filament, you can measure them, you can track them. And we found out that indeed this filament have the size an approximately uh, average of 2.7 nanometer. And 2.7 nanometer is the calculated diameter of double-strand RNA. And the double-strand RNA is an intermediate or viral replication. The single uh, RNA, the positive strand RNA of the virus need to be replicated going through a negative strand synthesis. And this double-strand RNA is probably what's inside here. And then positive strand RNA is uh, taken out of the double membrane vesicles. So indeed, we found out that the replication occurred inside the DMVs. But there is a, a small problem. How the RNA goes out? How the, RNA, uh, how the RNA can go out from these vesicles. There should be a pore, there should be an opening. For the, if you remember the flavivirus, we had the neck. There was a clear opening where the RNA can pass through. Here, if you look at it, there was nothing. The, the best we can get, here the, you see how, how smooth it is? The best we can get is this kind of region, but there is not a clear opening. So what's happening here? How the RNA can go out? This was the main question for all the virus that were inducing DMVs, not only SARS, hepatitis C, all the virus that make DMVs. The main question was how the RNA can go out of the, of the vesicle. And indeed, uh, one lesson that really resonated with me was what Michela was showing at the beginning, that if you use a, a fixation method that is not appropriate for your task, you ruin all your sample. And this is what happened in our case. So basically, we fixed these cells because these are SARS-CoV-2 infected cells. We had to fix them to be visualized under a microscope. And to fix them, we use formaldehyde, power formaldehyde. Three days after we published this paper on BioArchive, this beautiful image came out. And they, this group, uh, these are really clever scientists, uh, Montserrat Barcena, used another coronavirus. Not SARS-CoV-2, not highly pathogenic. They use mubin hepatitis virus that is a moving coronavirus. This is BSL-1, they don't need to fix. And when you don't fix this structure, you start to, to see macromolecular complexes, proteinaceous complexes that decorate the double membrane vesicles. This beautiful pore structure that cross, allow to cross to, to the, to the, to the to DM, uh, membrane of the double membrane vesicles is a gatekeeper that allow the RNA that is replicated inside to go out to this narrow neck, this narrow pore and be secreted inside the cytosol. And indeed, when they use SARS-CoV-2 and use a, the, a, the exactly fixation method that we use, the pore is completely destroyed. You cannot see anymore. So this is very important that you know what you are doing and you know that for your topic, fixation matters. So now we know that the DMVs, inside the DMVs there is RNA, and now we know that the proteinaceous pore allow the contact between the inside of the DMVs and the extracellular space. So, the beauty is that uh, 
coronavirus are not the only one that have, uh, have this pore structure. More and more cryo uh, FIBSEM and cryo electron microscopy shows us that all the viruses, all the positive strain RNA viruses, have this kind of structure that surround uh, the replication organelle. For the flockhouse virus, an invaginated vesicle morphotype, you have this kind of crown that has been uh, resolved at very high uh, resolution by uh, Paul Arquist that sit on top of the neck. These pore structures allow, again, the, the transport of the positive standard RNA that is replicated inside. Same happened for chikungunya virus, you find another pore. And same happened now for coronavirus, you have a pore. So, all the positive standard, this is a function, this is a structure that uh, beautifully show you how a function can be conserved among viruses completely unrelated. Probably this is the best way to allow uh, this organelle to communicate to the outside. And then, of course, we, are, we have a bit said, this is a beautiful achievement, but it was a bit said that we were not able to see. So, now we know that the pore is there, but which are the viral proteins that are responsible for the formation of this replication organelle? And this is basically a bit what Roman showed you before. We wanted to know which were the factors from the viruses that are important for the forming the double membrane vesicles. And again, if you look at the genome in the non-structural region, you can see these three proteins, SP3, 4, and 6, that are the only viral protein that have transmembrane. And since this replication organelle are anchored to the R membrane, these were basically the main, uh, the main candidate for this function. And indeed, uh, as Roman showed you, he, uh, he, he and the team at the uh, uh, TGM in uh, Naples <laughs> showed that NSP6 is responsible to forming this connector membrane that we observe in infected cells. And uh, the function of this connector membrane, as Roman showed you, they prove is to keep out some factors that are too big to pass through this very, uh, very, um, very limited luminal region. In fact, for instance, this ATF6, that is a sensor in the R, cannot reach any SP6 compartment. But some other com proteins that are very small can reach it. Again, atlastin can reach it. And also lipids can reach it. So basically, these connector members act as an highway, as Roman told you, to keep out some protein and take out some other protein that can be beneficial for the virus. And of course, take, take lipids, because the virus do not have any pathway to synthesize its own lipids. It relies on lipids of the cells. So the other protein were NSP3 and 4, and as Roman showed you, when you express only these two proteins alone inside the cells, you are able to induce double membrane vesicles. So just two viral proteins, together with probably many host factors, are able to create these double membrane vesicles. And the more interesting thing is that NSP3 is the main component of the pore. So basically, six molecules of NSP3 form this, this uh, crown region, these uh, prongs that project inside the cytosol. So this pore is formed by NSP3, NSP3 together with other factors, and we still don't know which these factors are. And this is a model of what uh, uh, the double membrane vesicles of SARS-CoV-2 can be made of. NSP3 that form the pore together with NSP4 that are required for double membrane vesicles, and the zip area region that is formed by NSP6 that is used by the virus to collect lipids, for instance, from the cell, to feed the double membrane vesicles. Of course, this is only one of the changes that SARS-CoV-2 induces in the cells, the double membrane vesicle. But what happened to the other organelle? I have already showed you that uh, the complete cell is remodeled by the virus. And indeed, if we look at the Golgi, for instance, this is a mock cells. The Golgi look like a beautiful uh, uh, textbook Golgi. In the perinucleal region, you have this large plate. But in infected cells, the Golgi fragment and is found in close proximity of double membrane vesicles, all scattered all around the cells. And this is a way, as I said you before, to coordinate a different step of viral uh, life cycle. To follow this process in live, we, used, uh, uh, we decided to use a trick. Uh, basically, we created a reporter that allow us to follow the SARS-CoV-2 infected cells. And this is how the reporter look like. You have a, a GFP that is anchored to the R and expose the GFP in the cytosolic uh, phase. And inside here, there is a nuclear localization sequence that cannot function, that cannot bring the GFP because it's still linked to the R. But when this linker region that contains region cleaved by the viral protease is cut during viral infection, this GP, GFP is now free and can go to the nucleus. And this is how it looks like. These are cells infected by SARS-CoV-2 these reported cells infected by SARS-CoV-2. And now you can follow in live 
what happened to the cells that are infected? Basically, just by tracking the cells that have evaded bright nuclei inside. So again, we wanted to see how the virus remodeled the different organelles, and we stained the Golgi. It's again our reported cells, and this is a recapitulate what we see in electron microscopy. But now we can count dozens of cells and, and analyze the dynamics and calculate the kinetics of these processes. You can see this is a cell infected, the nucleus bright, and the Golgi is all not is not anymore like this, but it's scattered all over the cells, still functioning. This fragmented Golgi still function because it's still secreted inf secret infectivity. And the same is true for the, uh, set of, uh, for the cytoskeleton. If infected cells, you can see here the cytoskeleton start to remodel and start to become these thick bundles that surround the perinuclear region, that is indeed the region where most of the replication compartment accumulate, creating this cage-like structure formed of very thick filaments that probably can give a, a, a structural support to the formation of the double membrane vesicles. So I'm almost done. Basically, I just wanted to show you that uh, using microscopy, using imaging, and combining different imaging modalities, we passed to a, a time where what we know about replication organelle was just that they look like invagination and protrusion, to a time now that we know the three-dimensional structure of this organelle, but also their molecular composition. We can start to know which are the molecules that decorate this structure. And this is important information because Understanding which molecule are important for viral replication gives us tools to create antiviral that can stop viral replication. And by doing this, they can stop viral infection. So I, I want to thank all the people that worked uh, on this project. This is the, the result of many different people. And this work was mainly done during my postdoc period in a group of Ralph Battenschlager at Heidelberg in collaboration with many other groups, EMBL facility and other uh, group in Heidelberg and outside. And now I'm continuing on these uh, stories in my own group at the TGM uh, Institute in collaboration with the Human Technopole where we perform imaging. Thank you for your... Uh,